Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson, and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. The main idea of this show, as most of you know, is to ask questions about chess and the chess world. Tell your friends, tell your students, you can get free free lessons uh, online for, from a master, answering any question, uh, and hope, hopefully getting some kind of intelligent response, or at least I can refer you to some place to go to get a good response. Okay, so I generally give, uh, well, first of all, how do you send these questions? Uh, the main way is by email, askiamwatson at chessclub.com. That's A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at C-H-E-S-S C-L-U-B dot C-O-M. So that's askiamwatson at chessclub.com. If you're an ICC member, you can send to my handle, John L. Watson, which is another way to reach me, John, J-O-H-N-L, L as in lion, W-A-T-S-O-N. So, um, and then, of course, we can get questions live right now. I just glanced at the chat, and here's Alan, as usual, which is great. Uh, 26 miles from out of the top 200 players. Ah, okay. Um, maybe we'll see each other. You going to visit? Because uh, I'll be there. Welshmen or Irishmen who can't swim? <laughs> I'm not sure if they're Irishmen can all swim. Uh, they certainly, certainly know a lot about boats, that's for sure. Yeah, the video of John froze last week. You know, I just got a, a, a DLL error, so I'm really, really hoping this doesn't happen again. Tell me if it does. The funny thing is I tested it and tested it. It was working fine. So it has something to do with once the streaming starts. And in fact, oh my goodness, I don't see mine. Um, let me just, I'm going to refresh mine. Oh my goodness. Let me just see if the moves work for a second. Because that's what really counts. Uh, I'm not seeing this. Are you guys seeing this? This is amazing because I tested and tested it because of the video. Yep. You know, I tested the camera. It's, it said it was a camera problem, but it was. It isn't. It isn't the uh, camera problem. It's a driver problem. So by the next show, which is going to be a little while, I'm, I will actually just reload everything. Uh, and if I have to, I'll get new software. Good. At least a move came out. That's good. So the moves are going. It's just my face isn't. And my face is relatively irrelevant, right, folks? As long as you can hear my voice and you can see the moves. And uh, that's too bad. I really expected this to work this week. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, what happened last week? And I'm assuming it'll come out again. It did last week, right? I could refresh the stream, I suppose. Try refreshing the stream. We'll do that once, and then we'll just get on with it, because it doesn't really matter if you can see my face. So let me do that. I'm going to uh, give me a second. I'm going to stop the stream and start it again. Okay, I think I should be um, streaming again. Tell me if I'm on. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I've tried to restart the stream now. Let's see if that works. And if it doesn't, we'll just have to live with it. Because uh, I have a lot of questions. How to play the H3 Kings Indian? That's a good one. I might have to. I play that myself. I've, I wrote a a uh, lot about that many years ago, and uh, it's become extremely popular. I, d I don't know if you mean as white or black, but I would love to treat that. I probably won't get to it this week because it's a big one of those big, wide, broad questions, uh, and I have a lot of stuff coming in. Nope, nothing changed. No, it didn't on mine either. I'm watching my own uh, screen, and that's happening. Okay, yeah, the webcam isn't working, which is funny. The webcam is actually working. I know because I tested it by itself. It just isn't working when we stream for some reason. Okay, sorry about that. You'll survive. Okay. <laughs> All righty, folks. Um, let me just uh, start out with, I don't think I missed anything too important in my introduction. So um, I, first thing I've got to tell you is that for the next couple of weeks, I'll be gone. Speaking of, which, speaking of the Isle of Man, I'll be going there. And Carlson is going to play there, so that'll be fun. And so we'll probably, what, about eight of the top ten players in the world or something? Assuming, depending on what happens, let me see, several of them are still at the... Um, are still at the World Cup, so you know they may not play. Uh, so I think all of them, except maybe Ding Liren, were going to play if they weren't involved in the last 
rounds of the World Cup. The World Cup, by the way, if you don't know, is going on right now, and it's down to the semifinals. And this is an incredibly important tournament because two, the top two finishers qualify for the World Championship candidates match. So this is essentially a major part of the World Championship. And we're now down to um, uh, Wesley So is playing Ding Liren, and Laveronian is playing uh, Maxime vachir le They all drew today. Um, these are two-game mini-matches, so the person with the who, who gets white next is, presumably has some advantage, and that would be um, Ding Liren and uh, vachir le um, I think Wesley So had really good winning chances, excellent winning chances, and just couldn't quite put it away at the end. And He's had that before a little. I mean, here's this massively strong player who may very well be playing for the World Championship. So uh, I'm not, it's not a criticism, but I think he's had, if he has a weakness, that's been a bit of a problem, the sort of just finishing off stage sometimes. A couple other players have that. Vladimir Kramnik has developed that a little bit. He, he has magnificent openings, wonderful middle games, and then sometimes he'll just uh, throw away the win at the end. Um, that seems to be happening even more often as he gets older. Uh, who else does that? Geary, Anish Geary, and he would admit that right away. He, he gets so many winning games. Now, maybe not this year so much. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if he can. Uh, I, I, I don't think he's making those kinds of mistakes this year, but uh, he has traditionally done that pretty often. So that's all kind of irrelevant. But I just wanted to tell you that the final, by the way, is four games. But in a way, it's in a, some, some sense to chess fans, it's a little less important because both of those players then automatically qualify. Bring rain gear. Okay, I'm glad you told me that. Wow. Okay, I hadn't really even thought of that. I was kind of hoping to hide in the hotel, but I wanted to take walks. It's supposed to be quite beautiful. Um, MVL is better in Aronian and Rapid and Blitz. That could be true. Yeah, he's higher rated, I think, in Rapid and Blitz, but, you know, who knows? Whoever keeps their nerve, and I think Aronian might keep his nerve pretty well in a, a game like that. Well, who knows? They're both, they both are going to get nervous. Uh, speaking of time, up to what level do the players need to bring and know how to set their own clocks at tournaments? Yeah, I know. Well, in, uh, in the United States, uh, everybody brings their own clocks uh, and or hope to find another one. It usually works out. More than half of the people bring clocks. And yes, if you're going to bring one, you might as well know how to set it, although there'll always almost be somebody who can set it there. One thing you can do is go on YouTube and put the name of the clock in. You can even say, how do I set the blah, blah, blah clock? Like in my case, DGT uh, 1200 or something like that. And uh, just put the name of the clock. And there's almost bound to be a video showing you how to set the clock. Uh, and the, the controls are ridiculously complex. Even if you have the manual and you read it, it, it skips big steps. Or it, it skips kind of the reason for why you're doing things. Okay. Oh, let's go back here. Something about... Yeah, the H3, King's Indian, um, I will definitely do that. Um, Thylophil says, now H4 and Knight A3, the report, uh, report plays. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful, crazy stuff. Um, Geary winning games. They call him the, yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, and some of those draws are because he, and he's made that point himself, that he played for a win very aggressively in some tournament, and, and he, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Once again, for ear 61, I can't set all the time controls. Absolutely, there is on my clock on the DGTs. There's a manual set for everything, so you have to go to the number that allows you to do the manual set, and then you have to just kind of experiment. If you have the YouTube videos, it'll help a lot. Even the YouTube videos don't give you everything. You have to, yeah, you have to practice. You have to work on it. It's very, some of it's really illogical too. Like for example, make it, the difference between the seconds and then the seconds for the increment. Sounds easy, but for some reason is, is all messed up. Um, what was the other question? Gary winning games, yeah. Yeah, and he, um, well, obviously he wins plenty of games because he wouldn't have the rating he has if he didn't, but but um, he's trying to become less drawish, and, and one thing that happened to him is he was getting, uh, I, what I was trying to explain was that it seemed to me, and I think he said this himself, that he was getting a lot of winning games. He was playing for wins, but then couldn't quite put the, the opponent away, and that's what happened to So yesterday. All right, so let me just continue here. Uh, you might want to watch that anyway. Um, maybe before I do anything else, I'll finish that OIVA question from last week, because that was a three-part question, and we only answered one. We talked about OIVA's status, Max OIVA's status among the world champions, and we looked at his Pearl of Zandvoort game. Uh, I didn't mention that his reputation has historically taken a hit, partly because of the 1948 
of Hog Moscow tournament uh, in front of the Hague in Moscow, which was uh, for the World Championship, the one that Bob Finnick won. Uh, but that's only a single tournament, and he was really 10 years past his prime at that point, I would say. And and somebody's bound to do badly in a tournament like that. I mean, so this, there's bound to be a last place. And, and with the Soviet group, there's only six players, and they included Bob Vinnick, Smizlov, and Carries from the Soviet Union. And so, you know, it, I, it wasn't that horrible a, a tournament. But um, I think that's hurt his reputation some, coming in last in that tournament. Um, the, so, so the questions he asked, the other questions, who was better in his prime, Max Oiva or Jan Timmon? Somebody else mentioned Jan Timmon in the chat. What was that about? Uh, Alan Welshman. Uh, what are you going to ask John? Do you know Jan Timmon? Uh, I've been in tournaments with Jan Timmon, and I remember him as a, as a teenager, wandering around to open tournaments uh, like everybody else. He was a kind of a ro roaming guy like most of us. Um, and, uh, but no, I don't really know. I've talked to him a few times, but just briefly, usually about some chess thing, I think. Um, very, very, very briefly. Um, an amazing player, obviously. And in fact, this question is very interesting. Uh, uh, let me see. Who was better in his prime, Max Oiva or Jan Timon? And of course, that's not really a fair question um, because it's different generations, and you really just can't talk about that. I mean, objectively, and Jan Timon's been incredibly successful. People don't even remember that he played a world championship match against Karpov. Now, it was the the match that was between the losers of the qualifier for the Kasparov match. So some people didn't consider it a real world championship. Nevertheless, I mean, that's getting way, way up there. Um, and, um, and of course, he's stronger than Oiva in the sense that he knows much more about chess because chess has advanced so much. But, in, but as relative terms, in terms of historical status, I think Oiva does get he does get the, uh, the nod because he was at the very pinnacle of chess and he played for the world, real world championship and he won it. Um, and I think he was about as good as his best contemporaries and, and he was better uh, than Tim in that sense, in the sense of really just pure achievement. Um, it's close though, because Timmons had a wonderful career. And of course, um, you know, everybody becomes stronger as chess history continues, so Tim would probably beat Oiva in a match, but even at their peaks, but um, I think, because he's, he's, you know, they start earlier, and they reach a much broader swath of professional players. They have to play against extremely strong players, and many, many of them, so, but of course, that's true of all modern players, so it's not really the, the way the question was asked, probably. Um, the other question, and this was from Moving Dutchman, I think, uh, it makes sense, being a Dutchman. Um, let me see. Let me go down, because maybe he's already made a comment. Um, here we go. Yes, Jonathan, I saw your chess history question. We'll get to that probably next week. Um, could throw it in there. We'll see. Um, uh, his other question is, do you think Geary can do just as good as those two? That's all I've been timid, or even better, or maybe not even close. And um, my answer is sure he could, because when you consider that he's only 23 years old, <laughs> it's really not hard to imagine him competing for the world championship at all and maybe winning it. Why not? Um, the main reason we can't be 100% sure that he's going to really reach the heights is because there's so many other mega talented players, just superb players that that are, are there's such a much broader range of top players that they can't all become world champion. I mean, even if you look at it right now, you've got Carlson's only 26. That's scary. Uh, Vashir Lagrav is, I think, 26 also. Caruana's 25. Nakamura's 29, I think, maybe 30. So is uh, 23. <laughs> and you've still got Aronian hanging around as, as an obstacle, as well as Mohamed Yarov. Uh, I mentioned Nakamura, I guess. Um, Karyakin, of course. <laughs> and all these are easily capable of getting... Uh, winning a world championship, or at least getting there. Uh, and then there's a host of young prodigies moving up. So that's always a problem, too. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, I haven't heard anybody, the, all these players are so close to each other. I'd say it's, I haven't heard anybody say that one person stands out, besides Carlson, of the top 10 younger players and is inevitably going to be a champion. I used to hear that about Carlson, that he was inevitably going to be a champion. And of course, I didn't see that. Uh, just for the record, it's kind of funny. I, 
I kind of just thought he was just another player who was having tremendous results for a while. I think I was deceived by the fact that he, he won a couple of sort of theoretical games, and I thought he might be sort of, I mean, I hadn't looked at enough games yet. And it turned out, of course, he was not really a heavily theoretical player at all. But um, anyway, shows my ability to predict. Although soon everybody caught on, obviously. Um, so it's just a cruel world out there is the problem. It's just too difficult to make predictions. But uh, um, so it'd be fun to have more more historical questions. I got books in just recently about um, Breyer and Blackburn, for example. These fascinating players, uh, strong, creative thinkers and players uh, who you know have sort of started to disappear in chess history, but are fun to talk about. There's a couple of fairly recent books on Nimzovich, who's always a source of material. So um, that's worth mentioning. Let me see. Carlson's closer to the pack now. That's right. We'll see. That might be temporary. does seem like that's what's happening. But remember, it's really just the last year. And a year is quite a while in the chess world, but uh, we'll see. I mean, you just never know. It is amazing that he had a, some sort of peak rating in 20... I didn't even realize this. He had a um, 2880-something, 80 85 or something rating as a peak rating. I mean, it is ridiculous. I, I guess I didn't understand he as a live rating, chess live rating. How are tournaments different in Europe than the U.S.? I would say very, very different. Slower time controls, which is very important. Um, what else? What should we expect if we play a board? Well, as you, as someone was saying earlier, you normally, uh, I mean, you don't have to provide your own sets, but you you can always find one and a clock. But it's a bother. I mean, it's you know you, things aren't provided for you. Um, I would say the conditions just generally are worse. A lot of times the lighting's not that great. Um, it's a big country, so a lot of times you get an awful lot of people in some random Swiss tournament, um, so it can be crowded. Um, just uh, It's more comfortable in Europe. People take it more seriously. I guess the biggest difference of all is there's a lot of opens in Europe that are one round a day. There's, only, there's no one round a day tournaments that are open in the United States besides the U.S. Open, which is once a year. So of the hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of other tournaments, uh, I think all of them are two rounds a day or three rounds a day unless they're partially invitational or you have to qualify in some sense. I believe that's true. There may be one, you know, one or two others, but I, I certainly the, the norm is two or even three rounds a day. Europeans aren't always used to that, and I don't blame them. I, mean, I, can't, I can't handle two rounds a day, so, <laughs> so I don't see why they should be able to. Um, 2889, there you go. Thank you. Uh, don't, Mr. Selden Khan, yeah. That, I don't, has there been a biography? I've seen a lot of articles about him, but I've never seen a biography of him. Marshall had a game when she moved his, <laughs> his knights 27 times in one. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, but blitz ratings, Jonathan, don't really mean as much at all. I, uh, they, they just, I don't think they're as relevant, just personally. Uh, it, it's, it's much harder to get your, well, <laughs> it's obviously harder to get your FIDE rating uh, way up at the when you're at those heights. But, um, okay, so... I don't think I missed anything on the chat, but if I did, I'll come back and scroll up and look at it. So let me see. Uh, what do you think of the Czech Benoni? Is it sound? Why don't more players use it? Okay, so I'm not really sure. Here's the Czech Benoni. I actually put it up here. Um, there's the Benoni. And then instead of playing like the modern Benoni like that or one of these kind of slow developing Benonis like that, uh, the Czech Benoni is this move. And the idea is to set up this structure here. And instead of fian shadowing the bishop, which would probably transpose into a Schmidt Benoni or something, you put the bishop here on e7. And um, that's the structure you're aiming for. And I was going to say, I don't know for sure. It's somewhat cramped. White has more space, and you're not challenging the center with either b5, uh, b5 or f5 once, once e4 happens. e4 is almost bound to happen. Um, so you're stuck with less space for your pieces, and that, and a lot of masters in particular don't particularly want to play with little space, even if they think that if they play very well, it's sound enough. I, I think I think it is sound. I think the most white's going to get is a small advantage. That I don't even know for sure. Um, I thought I'd show a little game, which illustrates some of the themes and maybe answers the question a little bit because it shows one thing that bad thing that can happen to black. Okay, so that's black's basic structure, and white plays here. Now, that's an odd move. I wonder if I should explain that right now, or maybe not. Uh, let, let me just say one thing. If, he, if white played here, black's a little worried about this move, pinning the knight, and then even if these things came out, then later on what's going to happen after black castles and white castles or something is that it's not going to be possible to prevent this move, bishop g5, exchanging off bishops, which is the 
theme of the, one of the main, main themes of the Czech Pannoni is to exchange off that bishop because that's White's good bishop by far. That's his bad bishop. It runs into its own pawns. This is Black's bad bishop. Wouldn't it be nice to get rid of it? And in fact, Black's done very, very well. I mean, if you look, for example, let me show you a line. This is kind of fascinating. Uh, this line, strangely enough, hard to believe, but this line here, Black actually has a solid plus record from this position in uh, Megabase, for example. I mean, uh, 150, 200 rating points, uh, really, really high winning percentage, including the highest rated games uh, tend to be winning. So I was really impressed by that. I mean, it should be equal, right? But somehow uh, Black may be already slightly better just because of his positional advantages. So that's why White wants his knight on f3, or maybe a pawn here and a bishop here, and then the knight could go, because you can stop, once bishop t5 happens, you can play f4. So that's a little background. I'm, I'm getting off the subject. So White plays there in order to put a knight on f3 and not get pinned. Uh, there's other reasons to play it, too, as you'll see. Black develops. Now, by the way, there are two setups for Black. Let me just show you real quickly what happens in this game. He plays knight e8, then he plays g6. Then he plays knight, forget white's moves for a second, and then he plays knight g7. I know it looks really weird, but it supports the move f5. And the bishop is still able to maybe come out onto those squares, is the idea. It's covering those squares. So that's black's basic setup. Uh, but black has one other setup he can play. You might want to look into it. It's very solid. And I know um, somebody, Fishbein, uh, drew a game against me. And actually, it was a US championship uh, uh, game. Um, and it was very frustrating. I couldn't get anything against it. He basically played, um, I'll just show you what the plan was. He played knight here, here, here. And I just couldn't make any progress. And I noticed in Megabase that there's quite a few games with that idea. So that would be the secondary idea. But overwhelmingly, I mean, very, very, by a large margin, Black plays Bishop, the other line instead. He plays with castles and, um, and G, knight e8 and g6 and knight g7. Okay, so white develops, black develops, and white plays there. Bishop d3 is the other setup. I, I've won some games later with bishop d3 in this, this kind of position. And then you just play a4 to stop b5. You gain space. You might play g4, but you might wait a little on g4. Anyway, in this game, he just plays g4 right away. Oh, by the way, this is Ivanchuk versus Sarawan. These are big, big top players, and both very positional, so it's nice that this is an instructive game. Not surprising, because they know what they're doing. <laughs> okay, so Serwin continues the normal idea. White puts more pressure here because he doesn't want f5 to happen. So he's going to put as many pieces as he can on it and maybe even be able to play rook here to open a file if f5 is played. The other possibility is the knight can come over here. I don't think it did in this game, but it's another idea. Just to drag all those pieces over towards the king side and for sure stop f5. Because f5 is black's only break unless he can get b5 in and b5 is easy to stop. Okay, so... White plays there, black plays there, white develops. Now, the book move, I think, more often is to play here. That's logical, right? But since black wants to go here anyway, it turns out maybe the bishop isn't really that great there. So Ivanchuk decides he does, he's not going to, he's just going to put in the center. And of course, later on, if he attacks with b4, that's going to help. That's going to add extra pressure. Okay, so black's ready for f5 maybe, but white plays rook g1, and it's too risky to play f5 now. Actually, I didn't even analyze it, but somehow it looks very, 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 very risky. So uh, how would you do this? You'd open this up and play bishop h6 probably, I think. And I guess this. And just take this, because now you've got that square too. So you've won a pawn for nothing, and you have an attack. And you have knight g5 coming too. So that would be, f5 would be awful because of that file. So if you're going to play f5, you play king h8 first. He didn't do that. He played knight f6. And the idea of that move is the following. First of all, he doesn't think white has any particular attacking ideas yet. Uh, if white plays a move like g5, that's a gorgeous square for a knight, and it covers a big outpost there. Notice that's an outpost. It's not attacked by any white pawns. So that would be a big positional mistake for white. Um, and the other idea he has is the following, what he plays, which is this. Challenging that side of the board, he attacks this pawn three times. I don't know if it's genuinely attacked, but it might be. And um, if, if white takes that, of course, that's happening. So white has to decide between g5 or just protecting the pawn. So he starts out by protecting the pawn. And black plays up, attacking the pawn again, thinking about taking it. White simply defends it. 
and black plays there. And that's a common move, a uh, common idea, which is to bring the knight to h7 and then play. This happens in the king's Indian often, too, that you play for this move, bishop g5. Again, exchange the very good bishop, which has no, no pawns on dark squares blocking it, for the very bad bishop, which has two center pawns and a, and a third potential pawn blocking it. So the idea is get bishop g5 in and you'll be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll equalize at least. That's the idea. Um, so white castles and allows bishop g5. Now, here's the only thing about the Czech Benoni and maybe the old Indian too sometimes is that, okay, he's got what he wanted. But in the meantime, look at these pieces. He's still extremely cramped. So even if positionally he stands better, his bishops are better, his minor pieces really aren't that great. This one's not even developed. It's hard to get untangled. And white has space in the center and the king side. And by the way, potentially white could have space on the queen side if everything else went wrong because he's got that little target on c5. So, so even though black's done everything right, it's not clear that white isn't better here. So Ivanchuk takes, has to protect this, um, and he's threatening now to take that and take this. Not now, though, because after taking the uh, on h5, there'd be a knight, ta sorry, knight takes h3. So sorry about that. Let me get this right. Let's see if there's anything on the chat here. I hope you guys are sort of enjoying this. Is there a variation where black can sometimes go bishop d6? That's in the snake, Benoni. You can play that. But once black's played e5, it really doesn't make any sense. Bishop e d6 really goes with the e6 ideas, the e6 and e takes d5 ideas. Then the bishop sits pretty well on d6, or reasonably well. Um, good question, very good question. And I can show you that. That's called the snake Benoni, and I can show you that. But that's where the pawn, the pawn went here and took here. So there's still a lot of room in this direction for bishop d6. In our position, a bishop on d6 would be awfully stuck. Okay, so, so in this position, if white takes, black's going to play knight takes h3. So instead, white drives the knight back again and moves up protecting this. And black plays a move. Now black's thinking about trying to attack on the queen side. He's also just making useful moves. Um, b5 is an idea. Also rook a7 coming over for defense might be an idea once you play b6. So a6 is useful for several reasons. And white finally commits to a move. So now we see the, the black's problem. The interesting thing is that white has knights that are doing absolutely nothing. They're going absolutely nowhere. Look at that. A bishop that's just pathetic, going absolutely nowhere. And the minute the white plays, uh, so white only has only one pawn break, at least on the king side, and it's this move f4. Well, generally f4 is a very weird move in this position because after black takes it, white's giving up that e5 square. But, but because white has so much space and because black's gone to such great lengths to not develop and <laughs> to get his pieces cramped just to get that bishop e, uh, g5 move in, it turns out that f4 is a good move. And let me show you why that is. Uh, black plays f6, and that's because he realizes that he's got to do something about f4. Let's just, let me just show you an example. Let's say black played there. Uh, or I'll, I'll show you even another one. Let's say, let's say black played there, hoping that after this he can blockade the, the position almost permanently. Well, you can either play over with a rook, or you could take and then play knight here, and then maybe even a sacrifice a pawn with... Um, with e5, and you find all of a sudden all your pieces are coming out. But the other thing you can do is say, okay, now that you're not on the file, maybe I'll just play here and play here next move. And then you won't be able to play queen e5 because I'll have queen takes f7. So it's getting hard to stop f4. And if you allow it, like he does in the game, let me see, so he plays bishop d7? No, he plays f6. If he allows it, um, I don't know if you have to play it immediately, but let's just say you do, then this move, this pawn structure is terrible. These, these, these squares are all weak over here. And white can put, can put rooks on the file. These knights are going nowhere. This is actually extremely good. That pawn's very weak, and that's a protected pass pawn. Um, so white wouldn't play, black wouldn't play queen e5, but if black doesn't play queen e5, very soon now white's going to sacrifice a pawn in order to get knights to these squares. And he's going to have his rook coming over too. This kind of position is always good for white. It's not obvious maybe, but if you look at it after the after this show, you'll see why that's true. So what black does instead is he tries to add more, pre first of all, free his knights a little bit, but also free his rook to put more pressure against the possibility of f4. So now f4, he can just take with the rook. So he's managed to stop f4, 
But of course, look at the price, folks. The price is now this is um, this is a backward pawn right in front of the king. And and these squares are still weak. These dark squares are still weak, even though there's no dark square bishop. The queen can sneak in over there, for example. So um, so black's doing his best and do, playing well, but it just turns out that white's going to get through no matter what happens here. Okay, um, so rook there, that was the idea, in order to double. Now, if black could play here now, you couldn't get f4 in. So white has to time all this perfectly, and so does, uh, so does black. Black's one tempo behind. Otherwise, he could have gotten, do you see everybody, everybody see that? If he gets that move in, I don't see what white's plan is. Maybe white's better, but if you can't get f4 in, all of a sudden that's not so clear whether he's better. Now, maybe you could play f4 anyway. I suppose that's possible. Um, whoops, let me see. Um, oh, I'd have to give well, an extra move. Let's just say you go over there and he goes here. I mean, maybe you can kind of go crazy anyway because you're on that square after rook takes, you're on this square. And after pawn takes, I don't know, something like that. This, this may still be better for white because he has this idea with the bishop coming here. He has the knight coming here. But at least it's a game. It's complicated and messy. White doesn't allow that. White plays um, this move instead right away. So why does that work? It looks like it just brings the other rook over, right, to attack the queen. But uh, now, now this is a threat. Rook takes g6. And it's very hard to defend against because queen h6 is also a threat. And e5 followed by bishop takes g6 or knight e4 f6 is a threat. So this game is basically over now. He, it, he has to stop that e5 move and stop rook g6. So he plays uh, rook f8 and then, rook f, and then bishop e8 to cover that square. And now white, you can guess what he does here. I'm going through this a little quickly, but I think you, it's very, very, um, very, very instructive. Um, so let me look at the chat here. Playing the king's Indian is white. I hate, really hate to defend passively. What's a good way to retain the initiative in the king's Indian attack is white? In other words, what line is the same as should I study? Okay, we can talk about that also probably next week, because that's a very broad question. Being an attacking player myself, I feel that who should be attacking is white, not black. Um, I think both sides can attack on both sides of the board and in the center. That's the great thing about the king's Indian. Uh, the king's Indian, bo both sides can end up getting attacks uh, if they play certain lines, so it's kind of fun on all sides of the board. You'll find plenty of variations where black attacks on the queen side and the center or on the king side and same thing for white. Um, I'm not really a banter blitz person. You'd have to ask the ICC people. I'd probably lose every game is my guess. <laughs> It'd be fun, but I think I'd disgrace myself. I mean, I'm a little too old for banter blitz, I think. Anyway, what do we got here? We've got, um, oh, so there's the move. And that, notice how that frees this knight, that frees this knight. That frees the bishop, and if the pawn takes, you've even got a pass pawn. You don't need it, but you've even got an extra pass pawn. So now the attack is really overwhelming. Black takes, white takes, and now he's busting through on the G file. Sarwan defends very well. I mean, he's still he's still alive, amazingly enough. But these look how look how passive these guys are. Now the threat is something like this, followed by just taking this pawn, or if the rook moves over, followed by um, eh, not sure. Have to look at it. Maybe knight G5. Um, so black unpins his knight on g7, white brings a knight to e4, and black brings a knight to e f5 to protect that pawn. If black had played rook here, oh my, oh well, you were just starting to chase away the defenders. This is looking really, really good. And then stick a knight on uh, g5 or something like that. Um, so knight f5 makes more sense. Nice, good, aggressive move. But it does give up that pawn. Now knight g5 is threatened again. I wonder if Yasser was in time trouble here. Okay, he tries to get to an ending. This actually makes sense. Good, a good piece, and he says being a pawn down is better than being checkmated. On the other hand, he's going to be two pawns down because white can take that c pawn, which he doesn't do because he doesn't feel it's necessary unless there's a trick I'm not seeing. But oh, knight here check, sorry. So white plays rook here first, threatening knight takes. Uh, black advances, threatening the h-pawn, and white wins this pawn. That's going to be a very aggressive piece. Basically, this, this square is the equivalent of that square in terms of effectiveness. And now white has a passed pawn, and that's the biggest factor in the position. And black's quite a ways away from being able to stop it. So, okay, white plays slowly because of the check coming down. And now he pins, pins this piece. 
I'm going to assume White's going to take that pawn somewhere. Yeah. So White's still a pawn up, but more importantly, what, what, what's what's happening here? Um, one more move. He hopes that Black White will take that, and he'll have this check, although I'm not sure that really saves him. Uh, and White just steps out instead. I think he resigns here. Yeah, he resigns here. This is too strong. This this advance is just too strong. And uh, also knight takes c5 is possible, too. Okay, I think it's a wonderful game. It's really instructive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thilo Full 28. Thilo 28 Full. But uh, <laughs> I'm afraid you're overestimating my, uh, my blitz abilities, which are pretty awful. Maybe I've practiced a lot <laughs> beforehand, uh, but I doubt it. Uh, I really admire these guys. Joel is amazing. I love watching him. And of course, Max is ridiculous, right? Max is incredibly strong, Max DeLugge. Um But, you know, they have the art of practical chess. I've never been a very practical player. So I'd be the type that would get a queen up and lose anyway. I think I think that would be my most common. That tends to be a big blitz result for me, being a knight or a queen up or something, or a brook up or two pawns up, or being about to queen two pawns and then drawing, falling on time or getting mated in one or something. <laughs> Blundering in any case, uh, and and losing on time. All right, so what do we got here? Um, yeah, so that's that game. Uh, here's another game. Let me do some uh, reader games. This is one I got quite a while ago, but I, I noticed that it's quite instructive, and so I thought I might do this. Um, this game is pretty interesting for for you guys, I think. This is a game from a viewer. I'm going to emphasize the structure of this game. I'm not going to take too long showing you the game. I always say that, but I think this time it's true. So it's, an, it's a Queen's Gambit, traditional kind of Queen's Gambit. And um, White's playing, we're, we're getting into exchange variation. Now, the normal move here, the most over the years move that's been played the most is this, in order to put, put the knight back there and therefore free this knight to come here because you've got to protect that square. So you'll see hundreds of thousands of games of that, just ridiculous numbers of games. C5 is, is interesting to me just because if nothing else, it shows that it's supposed to be a bad move, basically. You're going to isolate your pawn, but and usually you play it later. It's okay to isolate that pawn, but you kind of get your other pieces out first. I think one interesting thing about this game is it shows that Black can get away with quite a lot in, in almost any opening. I mean, White's definitely better now after D takes C5. But on the other hand, um, and, and it's instructive to see how he wins, but on the other hand, it's interesting that um, that Black's still in the game, he just in spite of having sort of done everything wrong. And I think that that's something about the resilience of chess. Very interesting here. Now White's going to put a rook on the open file. So what we have here is an isolated pawn, well blockaded, so it can't, the pawn can't advance, which means this bishop is kind of restricted by its own pawn and also can't go to any other square. There it'll, it'll just get attacked one way or another. So um, that bishop's kind of a problem piece, that bishop on c8. Okay, let's just continue here. So now black has two bishops. And two bishops are usually an advantage, but in a static position, these knights are very strongly placed. Knight here, rook over. This, and this bishop's a bad piece, and white's ahead in development. So it just turns out black doesn't have enough time. I mean, if you give him a couple moves, he'll be okay, but I don't know if that's the best move. It probably, probably is a very good move, so I'm not going to complain too much. I, but I, this would be... My first instinct would be to go here, but that doesn't mean it's better. And then after this and this and this, you don't take the D pawn, which frees this piece. You just bring a rook somewhere, like here. And all of a sudden, you're ready to take that D pawn at some point. And even play, even moves like E4 start to become important. So um, I think I don't know, I think I would play knight F4. I told you I wasn't going to go over these moves very carefully. So both players are playing thematically. Black, black blocks off a piece come, coming to that square. White gets ready to maybe expand on the queen side. Black simplifies, and white doesn't take it. Taking would be absolutely fine, but he, he decides he wants to keep some pieces on the board, which is fun. Both rooks to the center. Black tries to advance his piece, and now white gives up. Now, this is what's interesting. White gives up. Two knights for two bishops is a pretty bad trade-off normally in chess, but white has everything else going for him. He's just got everything else going. This bishop is not very good. This is a very weak pawn now. That pawn really is going to fall if, if black's not really, really careful. And black has no real attack or activity that's worth speaking of. So um, what does he play here? Okay, and now white's maybe attacking that, although this one's hanging, attacking the D pawn. But he's definitely attacking E5. So um, black takes. 
don't know, could black play bishop f6? Not sure why black couldn't play bishop f6. I guess white protects this pawn threatening this or something. Even that doesn't threaten that. Not sure about this position. This is an odd position. It might be okay for black. Two bishops are wonderful things, even when they are blocked off. Yeah, I wonder this position, I'm sure white's better, but I wonder about knight f3 being the right move. Anyway, we can we can look it over. And also, sometimes I say I'm sure of something, but I'm not that sure. <laughs> it almost looks like black is almost okay here. But anyway, so so now we got a pure two bishop versus knight, a bishop versus knight endgame. This bishop, this bishop here versus this knight, and you'll see that this comes up in a whole number of openings, mostly queen pawn openings, but also the French defense. This can happen. Maybe occasionally even the Caro can. This can happen, um, and a whole bunch of different queen pawn openings. This position can come up. So it's actually a position you should know something about. Can white win this endgame is what it amounts to. Black will never win this endgame because he's got a bad bishop and uh, a weak pawn. But is that enough to lose? The general rule is if, you know, Magnus Carlsen is playing or somebody absolutely top level is playing, maybe 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 even a, any average grandmaster, whatever that means, black will probably hold most of these. But uh, this looks like a particularly unfavorable one to me. So maybe white, white is winning. The point is, is in practice, white wins game after game because it's so hard to defend. Okay. So now black's got to be a little careful. That queen's a little out of play, so the queen side could get weak too. Maybe some move like queen b4 or something. Yeah, there we go. This is attacked. So things are looking a little critical here. <clears throat> One thing White could have done is played the other rook over and controlled the file himself. It's possible that was a better way to play, but I, I don't know that. Yes, White attacks that rook. That looks good. So is queen e7 forced? Yeah, probably. <clears throat> it's getting more and more like the pure knight versus bishop ending that you'll see in so many, so many openings. Uh, and white grabs the file. Now you'd think this would be enough to win because white has the file, the outpost, and the isolated pawn. But even this is not really easy, and it's fun to see how white wins this game. And I don't know if he even wins it by force, to be fair, but I think uh, maybe black still could have defended, but, but um, it was very convincing what white did anyway. White, the first thing white does is he brings his king into the center. Same thing for black, so black's doing the right thing. Uh, black tries to stop white from getting too much space because the other thing, f4 gains some space, b4 is going to gain some more space. So b4 and a4 are going to be good moves too. Rook c5 might be a useful move too. But the, the main thing is get your pawns moving, and that's what uh, white does. White's ready now to play g4. So black plays there. The problem is if white can play g4 followed by f5, well, that may not be true. I take that back. Maybe, maybe maybe bring the rook to c5 first, advance queenside pawns, and at some point be threatening f5. Or maybe g5 check. But anyway, it helps to get g4 and it increases your options. So what black's doing is he allows g4, but puts his bishop in front of his pawn. Usually an outpost in front of a pawn is, is infinitely better than a defender behind the pawn. But in this case, the bishop's still not a very good piece, as it turns out. That seems odd. It looks very aggressive, but it, there's no targets for it to attack. And the bishop is no longer defending the squares on this side of the board. So it's kind of a trade-off. It's good to get it active, but it's bad to keep it from defending squares on the uh, queen side. Okay, so now black just tries to kind of start making moves. And white decides upon this one. Don't know if that's good or not, but it works very well in the game. And here's why it's a funny little plan. Let me see. Do I have some notes on this? I should have actually mentioned this. Um, <clears throat> no, I guess not. Yeah, somewhere around here. Okay, people are making... Now, this makes sense. Now that the bishop's not there, this rook is able to penetrate and attack another pawn. Basically, the idea is try to run black out of moves, too. That's one of the other ideas. Um, good, get more space. Okay, the king tries to get rid of the rook, but now the rook's got another pawn to attack. And um, king comes back up. The pawn up, remember I mentioned that, advancing those pawns. It never hurts to gain more space. It cramps black's pieces. King back. I think this was a good chance for black to play here and activate that rook. I mean, sometimes he's even going to have this kind of move or this kind of move. And he'll be able to give up some pawns to get some pawns. So that, that was probably a good move. Um, but black played passively, just went back again, and white did this very nice little pawn break. Whether that's the best move or not, I think it is. I think it's a very strong move, um, and we'll see how this works. Uh, 
black took this way, if black takes this way, the natural move is here <clears throat> to try to attack there and then walk in with the king, or just walk in with the king directly. Uh, but it's not so clear to me how good that is because the, the rook can cut off the king from moving over. And if, and if white takes a few times, that, that pawn's hanging. So I think what white would actually do, oddly enough, here is stop rook e7 and then play king f4. Very good winning chances. So black played bishop takes, allowing this terrible pawn structure to arise and the king to penetrate. And this should, you would think, be a win. Now, Black still had some some ideas here. Maybe King B6 was best. I know that looks abstract. But I, I think probably White's winning in all lines now because he's going to take, and then he's going to be able to penetrate and take that and have a pass pawn. Black will probably all, also get a pass pawn, either here or here, but it'll be too slow. White's going to get his first. And I think, and think, in fact, I think that's pretty much what happens. Okay. No, actually, I give a bunch of long lines where black gets a pass pawn. Here, black didn't try to get a pass pawn, so he basically just loses. Um, now, now black's run out of moves. Very nice six on. Very typical of these endings. The king, the the rook can't go back because you just lose the king and pawn in game. The rook can't go forward because the rook takes b7 check. The rook can't move over because of king takes a d5. Uh, so black's run out of moves. He sort of desperately tries that. Moves over, and white plays that move, threatening check, which is going to not only exchange rooks, but also queen the pawn very quickly. So so that's that game. I think it's a nice, instructive game. You should know about those bishop, uh, good knight versus bad bishop uh, positions. Well, I see I see that the, the people are paying attention. They like, they like this game or something, because I'm not getting any more comments on the, on the chat, and that's Great, because I have more games that I was sent, or more questions. Um, here's an older one that I never got to, but it was asked about uh, by a student anyway, not not on the show, for the show, but I kind of got this question twice, once on the show and once not. Um, it's uh, it's about this, this variation. I think another very instructive, I'm trying to pick things that are instructive. Actually, that's the wrong order. Let me show you the real order. The order is here. It's a Nimzu Indian. And I have a bunch of experience in this line, unfortunately. And I've written about it. I play this move myself. And I have played this move. More recently, I've played this move. But but uh, I know quite a bit about this. I suggested playing this in my book because it's fairly it's a strategic opening repertoire for white. It, it has good strategic ideas. It's not risky. Bishop d3 is a little riskier and uh, gives you interesting play. So what I was asked about is this, which has become very popular again after many, many years. I think this is Keane's move. I think it was Keane that originally suggested this. Or maybe he suggested... Actually, that might be wrong. This may not be Keane's move. But it's somebody a long time ago suggested this with the idea of putting the if here, putting the bishop back on f8. And that looks kind of ridiculous, but the thing is, what's white, white's knight all of a sudden, it doesn't look quite right. And black's ready to just play d5, or maybe c5, or both of those moves. So um, so white plays, I'm just going to show a game here. Whoops, no, I should I should do that. Let me, let me do this. Uh, e, x. Uh, Shiva. I have a bunch of games in this line, but this is the one I want, I think. All right, this game went, here we go, like this. Okay, and I mentioned those moves. Okay, so Black's not developing anything, but he's ready to do that. And, and just for example, where's this knight gonna go? The knight has to go somewhere so that the bishop can get out, basically. And if the knight goes there, Black can very easily just play like this and this, and all of a sudden his pieces make a lot of sense. Kind of a King's Indian structure where his bishop is free and he gains a tempo. It also turns out that's a pretty safe move too. Um, white can play a move like this, but after a move like this, he's gonna have to free Black's game by taking and taking, which opens up the rook. Remember that, you might wonder what that rook was doing, and opens up the bishop. So Black's fine here. And you might ask, well, why did he voluntarily take on c4? Well, it's because c4 was threatened. For example, here, here, and you're gonna have trouble even getting that pawn back. Or if you get it back, you're gonna Black's gonna have a fine game because he's gonna be able to break through with these kind of moves. So 
So what does white do in this position? Sort of interesting position. So I was asked about this line and asked if there's any way to get even the hint of an advantage for white. I'm not so sure it is. I think this is a, this is a perfectly good thing. It's good to know for black. It's also good to know for white. Uh, there are a lot of tries for white, but I don't think any of them actually give an advantage by force. In this game, white played this move. I'll play this because it's entertaining. It's an entertaining game. Um, and that's one of the main moves. The other move is to stop d5, which is about to come by playing here. And the third move is to, and let me just show you what you do against that. What you do against that is you, you can play there. You don't have to play this first, but you can if you want to. And, uh, and then white makes, I don't know, maybe a move like this, for example. And then black has this nice idea of playing for the move c5. Um, for example, straight away, like that. And guess what that is? Let me just make a few more moves. That's a Benoni defense. I don't know if you recognize that, but that's a modern Benoni where white's played very passively. And we'll have to take one more move to play e4. Now, in terms of time, having to play e3, e4 is not bad because black's taking a lot of time bringing his bishop all over the place. But in terms of structure, the knight on e2 is really a problem and should mean that black's just fine here. And white can play this way, but it's not inspiring. Sort of a clever little kind of transposition. Uh, there's a lot more to d5 than that, but I'll just stop there. I played this move twice in tournaments and lost twice, so I have a very bad memories of this variation, although I'm playing it for black, too. Um, I won't show you those horrendous games. Or maybe I will at some point, but I won't show them to you right now, anyway. Um, the problem with that move is that once black plays there, this knight's not doing much. So even though white's got a pretty nice central position, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to make progress. And black eventually can play, you know, b6, bishop b7, maybe c5. And all he does is equalize, probably, but if uh, white gets ambitious like I did, uh, you can actually lose these games. Okay, although one game I was, I was probably winning um, fairly early on and then messed up. All right, so I have terrible memories of that line. Um, so anyway, in this game, he plays e4. Very natural, right? Well, you, you give white the center, why not take it? And the only answer to that is this bishop's still not getting out very quickly, so white center can be kind of exposed. And ta taking uh, is very similar, but it does allow the bishop to get out. Okay, so now, unfortunately, that's a threat, winning a pawn. So I think white does take here, yeah. And then white plays there. Now, that move makes a lot of sense, because if white plays slowly, I don't know, some, some other move, and black plays um, c5, then if white ever takes that, or if black takes on d4, this pawn would become weak. So he's defending it in advance so that if c5, he can either take it or at least defend that square without losing the e-pawn. So black does attack the center. Black attacks the center again. And white captures. And um, it's interesting to look at game lines where he doesn't capture, just to show you what black's up to here. Sure, white's got a big center, but he still doesn't have these pieces out. And that center can be loose and allow for sacrificial ideas. For example, uh, the knight can go here threatening this move and so that means b3 is well if b3 the problem is you're going to play break with f6 you're going to take and then play f6 so the best move is probably here <clears throat> but then these are attacked and if he comes back here all of a sudden you've got to move like this putting more pressure on the center and all of a sudden black's much better and you can still play f6 soon so it, white center is just a little overexposed. I'm not, not necessarily enough to be worse, but enough that black's perfectly okay at least. So in the game, white takes, and that's the main move that's been played in a lot of games. Now black has all sorts of clever things he can do. Um, one thing he can even try is this move, just to really break up these pawns. And if white tries to defend, then uh, I don't know if you want to take for sure, but you could, and then play a move like this. <clears throat> you're giving up some pawns, but you're doing it with with, uh, with tactical ideas. Just for example, if knight takes, you can play check, and then the bishop has to come back, and then you can take this one. And all of a sudden, this pawn's falling, and the king is very exposed. That's actually just probably a winning position, I imagine. Um, so that you, there are all kinds of funny things you can do. In this game, he played here. You can also play bishop takes c5. Uh, white played knight takes d5. If white plays b4, black can play d4 with a big counterattack. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and I can show you the lines, but they'll get too complicated. It's going to get too late for that. So let me just keep... Um, 
uh, and Joel ben Benjamin coming out tonight. That's cool. You're going to enjoy that. Um, <clears throat> so what else do we have here? We have Knight takes d5, winning a pawn. But look how tied down black is. Still can't get that piece out. Can't move that piece. Black's about to either break through with this or maybe even sacrifice a piece on e5. That's how well he stands here. Um, so white plays that move, which turns out to be the only move. It's a very good move because it, it grabs some initiative before black can start sacrificing everything. Black plays there, a good aggressive move. And uh, I think that's right, yeah. And white manages to kind of protect most of his stuff. Now black's still a pawn down, but he's got all his pieces out actively. And now this move. Now there's a threat of taking here because, and there's also a threat of bishop f3. Rook g1, queen takes h2, winning big material. So, and if white captures the piece, then that's what, which is what he does, because he's got to get some material for all this, then that happens anyway. Fork on these two squares. You might say, why can't white win material? He can. And in fact, white is materially ahead here, but black now grabs that. And so right now, white has two pieces for a rook, but look at the king stuck in the center of the board. So very risky position for white, although he played it quite well and managed to draw. draw. But notice that if he takes here, this is just getting very hard to defend because this is happening. Bishop here is an idea. Uh, queen over can happen. The other rook can come over to the center. Very scary position. So, so he plays... Um, sorry, he does play there. Oh, he manages to kind of get rid of the queen or at least divert the queen. And the queen takes. I don't know if the queen had to take there. Uh, probably the queen could have just gone back. If he wants to try to maintain a small advantage, attacking here, threatening rook over, probably a little bit of an advantage. But uh, instead he bailed out with that and took his pawn back with check and then played there. And now the thing is black has a pawn and a rook for two pieces and has the initiative. And it's very, even though a pawn and a rook, two pieces are usually better than a pawn and a rook, the fewer minor pieces are on the board, the fewer pieces are on the board, the more the rooks are strong. You get closer to the end game, the rooks get stronger than the minor pieces generally. And this is, a, not always, but in this, in this case, it's, it's true. Notice that black threatens bishop c5 because after the knight moves, there's rook takes check. So white has to move quickly. He defends that so that after bishop c5, he can move the knight. Black plays rook c5 instead. And, you know, I don't think I'll go much further. You just have to take my word for it that this is about even, and eventually they drew. I can make a few more moves. Uh, white doesn't have enough pieces to pile up on a pawn and win it. And black doesn't have enough pieces to break through and uh, create threats. So I mean, I'll just stop there. They played another 10 moves or so, and really very little happened. But I thought it was a nice game and a really instructive game. Uh, okay, so that's the answer about, so just to repeat, that's kind of the answer to the question. What about this variation? This is the Nimzu Indian here. This is a good line for white that I think all of you should learn. If you're gonna play the Nimzu Indian as white or black, you need to know this move E3. There's only two main moves. This is the one that's been played more often than any other. The second most, I mean, only two main moves. And the second one that's been played most often is queen here. Uh, there's tons of other moves like bishop g5, knight f3, f3, a3, the same-ish. Uh, but in the end, the moves that are the most critical or most professional anyway and give the most winning chances probably are queen c2 and e3. f3 has been played a lot recently, but I don't think it's been, I think black's pretty much solved what's going on. Okay, Jonathan Russell, can you show some lines for black in the scotch gambit to Bois ready defense? Well, I know the Scotch Gambit. I don't know what the Dubois ready defense is. Sorry about that. Uh, the Scotch Gambit, at least, well, here's the Italian Scotch Gambit. Is that the one you meant? You'll have to tell me, uh, Jonathan. And I've got a delay, so I won't be able to answer instantly. I think about a 30 second delay or something. Hopefully 30, sometimes longer. So tell me if that's the right one. And then tell me what the moves are that lead to the Dubois ready defense. Black here has two moves, uh, bishop c5, which often leads to the max lang attack, or knight f6. And there's a new book about all this uh, from the white point of view by uh, Fishbein that was just published. So if you're interested in this, in this particular gambit, so you do mean this one, but what moves after this? Which gambit, which defense? Do you know, uh, do you know, uh, can you tell me which one is the Dubois ready 
defense. That would help Jonathan. So I got to wait for that answer because there's a lot of defenses here, but um, those are the main. Th those two moves are the main ones by far. <clears throat> I can show you some things about this. I mean, if you play here, one of the old. Well, there's there's just so much to look at. Fishbine wants to play there and play this line. That line with knight takes e4, and um, but you can play other moves too. You can play castles, and then you can go to the old canal variation here. Rook here looks like it's got pressure here. Black plays here. It looks like black's just two pawns up, but white has a little sacrifice here. And then a nice double pin. He's attacking the queen. I'm sorry, queen. And he's attacking the, the knight, and he can't be taken either way because of the double pin. This one loses the queen, and this one is illegal. Okay, so that's called the canal variation. Black can play either queen h5 or queen a5. They're both good. Uh, and white plays here. White's still a pawn down, but threatens double check and mate. So, uh, actually, I'm trying to remember. Is it bishop? I assume it's bishop e7. Could be bishop e6, too, but I think it's bishop e7. Actually, maybe not. Boy, my memory's terrible. And then white has this tendency to play, sometimes even c3 kind of moves, but I, I've forgotten the theory. Um, so, so that's one thing that can happen. Um, let me see. Not sure. C44. Okay. Oh, we're at the end of the show pretty much anyway. So let me just show you um, the other defense, which is here, just protecting this pawn. And then you can get super ambitious if you want to and try to play this move, a gambit. Um, and one of the ideas is to play this move, queen b3. For example, takes... Could play check here because of queen d5 check, and then take here. I don't know how good that is. That's that's unclear. Probably probably that's what I would play. So maybe black doesn't take here. What would does? Oh, black counterattacks here. That's right. And now we're in the old Joko piano. If if we go that way, white. This is a famous old line. Now black can take here, which is more modern, or he can play here, here, and then block off the center. And you've a lot of you've probably seen this before. This position it's supposed to be equal. <clears throat> and um, instead of that, what White wants to do here, I think, is gambit a pawn. I think. What do I know? I guess here. Yeah, I think that's it. And once again, if d5, which is the standard answer to e5, then you have bishop b5 here. And after knight here, you have takes. There's also, I think, a chance to play some weird move like bishop e2 or something. Is it here? Yeah, some, no, I don't think it's now. I think that's another position. Okay, well, I can play the Evans Gambit before, but not in the line that I was giving. Um, <laughs> hit the opponent then dump in the canal. That sounds good. That's my that's my only chance. Uh, very good. Uh, yeah, what do we got here? I'm not sure, c44, bishop g5. Well, I can play the Evans Gambit with b4. Yeah, I think in this case he really can't because he's already played d4, right? So after d4, bishop here, bishop here, it's no longer an Evans Gambit kind of position because after bishop takes, c3 is not with tempo. See the difference in the Evans Gambit, which is, which is this position. Then it's dangerous to take the ball. Well, Somewhat dangerous to take the pawn because you've gained you've gained a tempo on this. There's no there's no capturing that, and that means you've got a big center coming up with d4 next, castles and d4, those kinds of moves. So that that's the Evans gambit. Uh, in this position, this uh, this Italian it's also called the Italian gambit. In this position, your your choices are more limited. Here's the famous Max Lang attack. It goes like this. This, this, watch, watch me get this wrong. <laughs> takes, takes, and now you have choice between playing check, takes, and bishop g5. And um, it's very common to play check here and takes, and then bishop g5. And I used to analyze this. I think it's in M's book, his recommended uh, repertoire for white. Um, and I, I don't remember all the details, but in the end I remember I did think black was okay in these positions, but, uh, but maybe white is too.
And watch out for black going here because then you have that same pin again where he can't take that because the queen takes queen and the bishop's pinned. So then white, then black has to go there and then you swing the other knight over threatening. Well, knight f6 check is the main threat and black can't even castle. So this is, uh, this is big trouble. There's also this move knight h4 where the queen has almost no squares left. Uh, just for example, I think if here, here, the queen's stuck. Because if the queen goes here, there's check. And if the queen goes here, I assume you can check and take it and win a whole and win a whole queen, unless the king moves. Let me see, king. Oh, and then the, yeah, you're winning anyway. So that was easy. <laughs> uh, so I guess the queen would have to go somewhere else, but there's nowhere to go. Here, then f4, or just knight f6 check winning. Okay, so that's the Italian gambit, and we can you can ask, send me an email if you want to know more details, or tell me specifically what the ready Dubois is. You didn't just make that up, did you? <laughs> so, uh, the Dubois ready defense, yeah, yeah. I should know, you know, we wrote Taming the Wild Chess Openings, Eric Schiller and I, so I'm supposed to know all these strange names, but I think we missed that one. So, um, okay, I think that covers most of the chat, and uh, as I say, I'll be gone for the next two weeks, and I'll be in Isle of Man. So, it'll be fun to report back. Maybe I'll bring some games back with me. And uh, any questions you have, you can even ask questions about Isle of Man. Um, bring rain gear, thanks. I actually wasn't intending to bring rain gear, and that's so obviously obvious thing to do. And I have very little time left to prepare, too. All righty. So I guess that's about it. And um, uh, I want to thank everybody for showing and don't give up on the show. We'll be back in two weeks. That gives you plenty of time to ask some tremendous questions. Oh, look at this. Is an early knight g5 with fried liver ideas possible in the scotch gambit? I kind of don't think so. Let's take a quick look. I'm not sure. You know, I'm not an expert on these lines, so I studied them in the old days some. Knight g5 with a... Maybe it is. Let's see. Here, here. Okay, against this, you could play knight g5, but I'm afraid that here you're not going to get a fried liver. Well, I don't know. How does that compare with the main line, this kind of thing? I actually don't know. This check all of a sudden looks very good for black. This looks very good because you've got that extra pawn now that you don't normally have in this variation. That looks really good. I suppose white could take, but then you lost the two bishops. Um... So I suspect knight g5, d5 is good for black, but you can look it over and check, and I, I don't know the theory. And against the bishop's c5 line, <clears throat> um, if you castle, it's too late to play knight g5. Uh, against the bishop's c5 line, uh, knight g5 I don't think works, probably because of knight e5 or because of knight h6. You know, knight e5 is some old thing from a ready book where he says knight takes f7 favors white, I think. Takes, 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 queen h5 check, probably g6, queen c5, and supposedly that favors white. Yeah, sure looks like it does, doesn't it? Okay, so then, so knight e5 is bad. Knight h6 is certainly possible. Don't know what else is possible. There's probably other moves, but um, bishop b4 check ideas maybe. But um, d5, it looks like you could just take it. That's a little unclear, isn't it? Because the material's only even there. Okay, so that's critical. And now you could take it again, but this isn't going to work as well because black's got one extra piece out, so I don't trust this one at all. There, g6 here. Now I can play, whoops. Now I can play d6 without allowing queen takes d4. That's the extra tempo, knight c6. So this position, I wouldn't want to be white, I don't think, because Black's got very active, quick pieces, and he's getting castled by hand. He can play rook here or f8, but probably e8, and then bring the king back and castle. This bishop's a really good piece. White's only got one piece out, and it's the queen. It tends to be a bad sign, right? <clears throat> so maybe it's even, but I, I can't believe white's better here. Okay, everybody, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, be sure to send me your questions. Don't forget. Uh, yeah. And uh, tracks or counterattack, we'll definitely do that next time. I'm going to copy the chat. 
remember, send me an email, ask I am what ask I am Watson at chessclub.com. A S K I M W A T S O N at chessclub.com. And uh, so anything you ask on the chat here, you can just send me a little email to remind me and maybe even add a little bit of detail. For example, that H3 King's Indian question was very good, and so was the general question about how white should attack in the King's Indian. But if you can send me an email that narrows it down a little bit or maybe explains a little more what the problems are, then I'll probably give you a better answer, and I've got time to think of things that will be really instructive to everyone in answer to those questions. Okay, who will win the World Cup, I was asked. Yeah, good question. Gee, I don't know. I mean, I guess... <laughs> Wow. In a way, so has, well, not anymore, not after today, because he, he drew his white. I was going to say he might have the highest probability because he has sort of the, quote, easier, unquote, pairing for the first round, uh, whereas Aronian and Vashir Lagrave are about 50-50 to knock each other off and then still have to play someone like so, or maybe Dingleren. So I, I would, uh, if, if the first round hadn't been played, I would say so was uh, a slight favorite in percentage terms. Um, in the two strongest players, even though Wesley is just absolutely fantastic, I think the, the most experienced players who've been at the top of the world long, longer are Vashir Lagrave and Aronian. Um, and I would say they're about 50-50. Certainly, certainly, if you just take those four players objectively and just look at them, those two would be a little ahead of Wesley, and then Ding Laren would be somewhat back. Um, and I'd like to hear you guys' opinion, too, as you go along. I don't think anybody answered that question. It's fun to see um, fun to see things being being answered. And, oh, yeah, and someone did say um, MVL is better than Aronian and Rapid and Blitz, and that's very important. So, yeah, if, there's, if there are two more draws, um, yeah, let me see. Then we get into the speedy stuff. I don't know how good Wesley is. I think he's pretty good at Blitz and Rapid. Uh, but Ding Liren is one of the best. Oh, wait, he's one of the best blitz players in the world, I think. I think he's number five right now. He's been as good as number three. So if Ding Liren can get to the blitz stage, that could be really something. And he's white in the next game, and that's an advantage. So right now, Vashir Lagrave has a little advantage over Ronin because he's white. And Ding Liren has a little advantage over Wesley because he's white. So anyway, we will see you 11-6. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Good, good, some opinions. Let's do this. Uh, Aronian or MVL? MVL is hot right now. That's true. I've been thinking that. And he's better in Aronian Blitz. 11 to 6 odds. Boy, that's pretty high. We're talking about Aronian, who, you know, could could be argued to be a stronger player than MVL overall. But it's a little, I don't know. They're so close. They're all so good. Uh, so you're right. Maybe the, uh, the uh, Rapid and Blitz will make a difference. It seems to me that... Um, Aronian can be incredibly good at uh, at blitz, and, and when it matters, like these, you know, these these matches. Wow, very good question, but I, I'm not positive MVL is going to be much better than Aronian. Not not 11 to six worth, maybe a little smaller, but I, I'll give you that. I think you, it's a good opinion. It's well 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 uh, backed that MVL is is better, um, but not. I don't think by 11 to six. That's that's a lot. All righty, folks. Thanks, everybody, one more time. And uh, I will see you two, two weeks from now. No, I'll see you three weeks from now. So you've got to remain loyal. Uh, collect games for me. Think about questions. And I'll see you in a couple weeks.